Okay, this is a brief uh, tutorial on United States GDP and its components. For those of you who study in economics, my macroeconomics is definitely going to be in of interest to you, but for anybody who follows this very important metric in terms of U.S. growth and U.S. production, it's the uh, final value of all goods and services produced in an economy, gross domestic product. And as an example, in 2016, GDP was approximately $18.6 trillion. So to give you an idea of the, uh, to put it in perspective, the government deficit, the government budget is about $3 trillion, and that's government spending, and the rest is comprised of different components, but obviously, or maybe not so obvious, the biggest component of and driver of domestic product in this country is personal consumption. It's the consumption by uh, the things we buy every day when we shop at the mall, or buy houses or buy cars and the US is a consumption driven economy as opposed to say Japan or China that are export driven economies. They're trying to change that to some extent but the US has traditionally been a consumption driven economy or a nation of consumers. So to break down the numbers uh, and, and, and another thing I should mention about GDP is we count the final product. So we don't count the for instance the dough or the cheese or the sauce that goes into a pizza pie, we count the final sale of the pizza pie. So this way we don't double count our GDP. So if, uh, if the pizzeria owner buys a sauce that's worth a dollar and dough that's worth two dollars and cheese that's worth a dollar and they spend four dollars on the raw material and the final cost of the pie is ten dollars, we count the ten dollars and we assume that the pizzeria owner adds six dollars of value. So right, ten dollars on the final sale is four dollar raw material. It's six dollars of final value, and the ability to add value to raw materials like land, labor, capital, and um, entrepreneurial ability—the ability to add value to those raw materials that every economy has access to—is what really drives an economy. And that's why we prize education, and we try to make people as skillful and um, productive as possible because then we, we as an economy could add more value to our raw materials as opposed to say a third world country that doesn't have the skills or the opportunities so they may be in a position where it's just an agrarian culture and they can only add so much to the raw materials that are available to them so that's more of an existential thing and we'll talk about that in further um, videos but at least it gives you an idea of what um, what makes up a sophisticated you know, a first world economy. So anyway, to break it down quickly, our disposable personal income on a percentage basis, we'll call it 75. So that's the money that comes out after you pay all your deductions uh, on your paycheck. That the government knows about that. The government knows what everybody's W-2 is, and they know that you're coming out with something at the end that you could spend. And we know that the fundamental law is we can only save and spend the money. That, that has to equal one. Um, so if that has to equal one, then... Um, then if we take the 75 of income and subtract out the savings, then we will come up with personal consumption of 65%. Because the money that gets saved does not go into GDP, it stays in the bank. And that's called the paradox of thrift, which means we've been taught since we were kids to um, save your money, right? But the reality is when you save money, it actually hurts the economy because the money goes nowhere. Uh, the money just stays in the bank. So, you know, the bank could lend it out, but we effectively have not done anything positive for GDP. You know, you want to save money, that's not against, we're not against that. But if you look at the problems the Japanese economy has had, and they're a nation of savers, they're not multiplying that money into the economy as quickly because they put most of their money in the bank. So when you're spending money, you're actually helping the country. So 75 less 10 means that 65% of the GDP in this country is driven by personal consumption. And again, that comes from our disposable income less our savings. So then it always has to equal one. So if you notice 65 plus 10 equals 75. And then 20% of our GDP comes from government expenditures. And the government knows where that's coming from because they're the ones spending the money. So in a good years, they're just spending money that are from tax receipts. But in years that are more challenging, like now, they may need to borrow to make up. If they're spending more than they're actually bringing in in taxes, they have to run a deficit. And they do that by borrowing money. They borrow money through treasury bills and bonds, and states borrow money through municipal debt. And when the governments borrow too much money, they raise interest rates and they crowd out the small investors. So that's one of the negative effects of a deficit. 
the third component is the corporate expenditures and that's also a uh, that's corporations that's what they're spending they're spending it on things like buildings and trucks and, 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 and computers they're, they're buying things capital expenditures to produce other things so that's the third component and finally we have our trade balance and that's something you've heard a lot about in the last election that trade is a negative and, and in this case and I'm showing you in, it's imports less ex exports so we're approximately bringing in 10 percent of imports but and we're sending out seven percent that's gotten better over the last number of years but because we're importing more than we're exporting we have a negative trade balance and that subtracts out from GDP that's a minus three percent so that's kind of where um, the last election kind of that's one of the things where it turned and you're le definitely learning about that in uh, vis-a-vis this um, uh, latest round of trade tension which talks about cutting down those ex imports and bringing up exports because the, the, the current administration looks at these numbers just the way we're looking at it and they're realizing that negative trade is a drag on GDP. Now, obviously, that's another deeper conversation. You need global trade and you may need to um, buy things that are made more efficiently in other countries and export them to, to other countries to lower comparative advantages. The argument being made by the current administration is well, we're not just getting as good a deal as we need to get uh, on that deal. So we want to get a better deal on trade. So that number doesn't look 10 and 7, but maybe it looks more like 10 and 10. It's neutral and everyone benefits. Because obviously the Swiss are better than making watches, and we, we at least assume, or you know, there are European fashion designers that are better at doing that and we're better at things like making movies and pharmaceuticals and agriculture. And if we both trade it's better for, it's better for everyone but on the other hand the deals have to be fair and I think, that, I think that's part of the argument if you accept that. And on this other side to finalize this this is a little pie chart of what GDP looks like. You'll notice personal consumption is a large part of this uh, GDP number. Uh, government expenditures is second, corporate expenditures is third, and a small part right now is the trade balance. So that's a general overview of GDP. We'll, this is the first in a series of um, videos I'll be doing on the economy and on and gross domestic product, but I at least wanted to introduce you to um, the concept of gross domestic product, where, it's come, where it comes from, and how it's calculated. Thank you.